This is episode 128 of the XY podcast with Fraser Jack. If you're an advisor, how are you articulating the deep conversations you have with your clients in your advice documents? We all know the traditional advice process and SOA has been severely overshadowed by so much red tape and compliance that it is so far removed from what the client actually needs and wants. Here's another question. What if we scoped advice specifically on our client's goals rather than advice related only to product categories, such as insurance and super? These questions and a whole lot more are thoroughly discussed in this podcast with Fraser Jack, host of the Goals Based Advice Podcast. This is an awesome conversation between Fraser and Adrian from XY. Fraser explains the interesting power dynamic between advisor and client, why advice businesses are ultimately relationship businesses, and the subconscious biases that may be affecting your conversations with clients. We hope you enjoy the many nuggets of wisdom shared in this episode. And as always, if there's something we can be doing to make your XY podcast experience that much better, be sure to reach out at xyadvisor.com. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $10 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leading managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. Fraser Jack. How are you going? Pleasure to have you on, man. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, we, we've had you on. Oh, we had you on in the Zoom days. No. No, didn't the we? first time. Yep. We didn't even have you on no. the Zoom days. No, nope. no, nope. I've been playing hard to get. Yeah. <laughs> I hope Clay's asked you before. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the whole Queensland thing makes it difficult sometimes. That could be the, could be the case. Could be. Yeah, well, well, it's good to have you on. Thanks. So, um, it's been a big week. We just sort of, we just came out of the Royal Commission and... What's this Royal Commission thing you're talking about? What's I don't that? know, this RC thing. I, I don't know, I don't know. You haven't um, noticed any, anything about it? Yeah, yeah. there's been a, obviously a fair bit of commentary about it, hasn't there? Yeah, do you think there's much substance to it? Or? Uh, oh, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> there's going to be a lot of people in a lot of pain, I can I imagine. Yeah. A lot, a lot of pain. Well, we can talk about the solutions because I've got a few ideas. I'm sure you've got a few ideas. Uh, well, yes, uh, but you know, I think uh, we just have to try and work out where everyone's going to land and what, what it's going to mean, and who's going to still have a job and who can still make a living. Well, yeah, like think back to how long is it that you were an advisor for quite a number of years? About thirteen years. Yeah. Yeah. And so, would you did you ever envisage that this sort of things would get to this point? Yep. You did. Yep. Is that why you got out? <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> Seemed like the smart thing to do. <laughs> like shit, it used to be fun. Is that what? Well, it was. It, there's a. You know, I think when I was in the role, I was thinking to myself, education standards are going up. There's going to be a lot of people getting out. There's going to be, uh, you know, uh, there was pre FOFA. You know, FOFA was sort of the the, the topic. Um, it was going to be harder. It's going to be less profitable. Um, so to me, it was like, well, if if we get to the pain point and everyone's going to try and sell their business at that time. There's going to be a supply and demand issue. Prices will go down. Um, business valuations will go down. So it was like, well, it seems like a smart thing to do to beat that uh, falling price. Yeah, well, that's a good point because there's a lot of people dealing with it now. and it's, Yeah, there's a lot of pain around it now, obviously. Yeah, it's, yeah, um, valuations are just are going to hurt. Yeah, and that's, yeah, it's, it's um, I don't know, I can't feel, I can't help but feel like, I guess, sympathetic to... To everyone that's sort of going through, because obviously change is hard in general, but I think some of the changes that are required are so fundamental that it's like it's beyond comprehension for some a lot of people. Yeah, there's always there's always two sides to the story, obviously, and, and that's what Commissioner Hayne has brought out. He's really batting for the consumer side of the story, mm. which is great. Um, but yeah, to to take a business and then turn it into a you know, that was worth something one day and make it worth zero. You basically, you know, the, the humans inside that business are going to suffer, aren't they? Mm. I think that, and the other element around it is like the, the small business nature of this. It's like I don't, you don't feel as sympathetic when it's like a listed company or like a big business. You're like, well, they, they've got the resources, they can deal with it. But the impact of the commission, like one of the, well, 
a lot of people's perspective is that it's actually not impacting the larger corporations at all. Uh, that's that's some perspective, and there's still an opportunity for things to play out that will impact them. But a known impact is that small businesses in financial services, whether it's advisor or mortgage broker, are going to have a tough time. Yeah, it's, it's mum and dad businesses that are going to suffer. Mm. Absolutely, and the, and the banks will uh, can take a hit, but they can. You know, it's just going to be a small deflection in, in, in many cases and they'll keep on being banks. I've got jobs to do and I've got share price to push up and and I guess everybody wins it because they've got bank shares and they're super. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think there'll be a lot of small business that would be punished. Yeah, it's, it's sad. Well, I reckon we could dwell on that for ages, but um, well, it's not it's not our style, Fraser. No, let's, let's get not. Let's not. get a bit more positive. Let's, yeah. How, like, you've been running your podcast, what's it called? Uh, the Goals-Based... Oh. You clearly don't listen to the Goals Based Advice podcast. I do. I I, I listen of it. Um, <laughs> the Goals Based Advice. Yeah, podcast. yeah. That's been it's been really good actually. I, I started it up. I, you know, I wanted to have a conversation about Goals Based Advice. Um, didn't really have too much idea of how to run a podcast. I thought, okay, we'll just give this a go. Uh, dip your toe in the water. Got well, some... you just listen to those guys X Y Advice and you go, shit, it can't be that hard if those guys are running. Like yeah, well, that. you've been you've been around a while. You met some really really cool people, and you're like, okay, well. You know, I'm interested in what they have to say, so surely, surely, surely somebody else might be interested in what they've got to say. So, um, and, and yeah, we just kicked it off, started it, and started putting them out. And, you know, it just it grew, and, it, you know, it's, it's interesting. You sort of you, you, you turn on the stats and you go, oh, some people listened or down, at least downloaded it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then and the next thing that just grows and grows, and it turns into something that you, you're actually, um, yeah, really motivated by. But, it's, but the conversations themselves, I actually get a crap load out of the conversations I'm having and and therefore I feel that maybe, maybe other people do and, and so yeah it's, it's it's I kind of from a selfish point of view really enjoy doing it for myself yeah totally and then, oh it's always interesting enjoying, isn't it yeah so, putting it out there I think it's something about like it's like you, you have conversations like we'll have conversations um, outside of like this situation but I think having it's like having like someone in the room with you are you having a good conversation with Fraser? It's like, is it? Is there any value in this conversation? So it really, it tends to, well, hopefully, like not as much in my case, probably more in your case, eliminates a bit of the shit that you'd usually talk with people and maybe tends to direct it to real, a lot more substance. Yeah, I think um, like if we're having a chat over a drink, we'll probably tend to talk like how good's some, the beer, some like. good stuff and then some, <laughs> some crap. Uh, and then when we're having a chat on the podcast, you're directly targeting you're actually digging deeper those secondary questions which um, you sometimes don't do at the pub but yeah it's, it's good yeah so everyone out there you may be witnessing the deepest conversation Fraser and I have ever had it could be <laughs> could be yeah could be so so what you've had some cool people on actually no before we go into that you you went out to um, what's it called in the US the X, uh, um, well I've been to, to XY Planner conference and i've been to fincon 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 yeah. so that was a few years ago would yeah. you say that this podcast is like the result of uh, like a, years in the what making? that set in um, motion yes because uh, i've met pat flynn at both fincons i've been to mm-hmm. um and then i've got you know you follow them and they they're really good at sending out lots of emails and eventually you start to engage um, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause you've, you've been to a lot of stuff where you, people are presenting on podcasting and they're saying, I do this thing, this is how I do it. And you go, oh, okay, that sounds pretty reasonable. And then they say, and, and this is how I, uh, you know, structure the questions and this is how, and so you're just picking up these little bits along the way and it's, um, absolutely. It's a couple of years. I actually making... subscribed to that, um, email list. <laughs> yeah. But the, this is the thing, right? You go, oh yeah, this, I'd like to do that. I'd like to do that. And then eventually you, 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 you get the courage up to actually do it and put it mm. out there and um, and I guess every time you create something and you put it out into the world you're a little bit nervous about it and then it gets a good response so you go okay it wasn't so bad you know and yeah totally and move on and of course when you have to uh, edit podcasts you then you have to listen to your own voice and you go oh my god do I sound like that and then and then you you, get, that. you, you get over it after a while yeah. yeah exactly like when we first started the XY Advisor podcast it was um, yeah I was shitting myself I was like I'm going to say something stupid. Hmm. And then um, and then you and then do say just... something stupid. And you're like, ah, oh, some, someone said that was funny. I yeah. was like, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Turned out it was, just, it was just you. It was just me. After all, that's how we behave. So no, no, point, no point not, uh, not worrying about it. 
Yeah, I think I think it's it's interesting. I think a lot of people you work out that people actually just like as long as you're being real and like yeah. you're not you are being yourself. People people appreciate that. Yeah, I th- I'd say that one thing that has taught me uh, in the podcast, which is a pretty uh, which is a decent skill to have when you're talking to clients, is to not be thinking about the next question. Mm. So sometimes you just that deep listening conversation. You go, oh yeah, and then you go, oh, I like that, and then tell me more about that part. You know, like rather, it's like a goosebump story. Than, like choose your own adventure. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much, <laughs> which sometimes means you don't know what the next question is. But yeah, yeah it's a. Well, let's let you in a little secret. Most of the time, I don't know what my next question. <laughs> but actually, to the listeners out there, it's probably quite evident a lot of the time. <laughs> so, so you ended up kicking it off. And what are some of the coolest things that have happened while you've been doing the podcast? Uh, I would say I really uh, like Carl Richards was a big um, guest yeah. to get on, and um, and then. The interesting thing, what happens off the back of a lot of those conversations after the, you know, you turn it off as you go, well, do you know anyone else that would, you know, come on, that could come on the show? And so you get introductions um, to more people and more people. So I managed to get some really cool introductions to people that um, I didn't really know. And, and I've actually had people reach out to me and say, hey, I, you know, can, can I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to chat about those. I like talking. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly right. So it's been, um, it's been great. You know, like, I mean, the, the, some of the coolest um, moments is getting feedback. You know, mm. like when people actually take the time to write to you on LinkedIn or on or on, on Messenger and say, hey, you know, I really enjoy listening to your show. It's, it's helping me do blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, wow. You know, like that's the that's the goosebump moment, right? When you go, oh, that's just made my day. That's really cool. Yeah, it, it is. Keep, you know, it keeps you, keeps you motivated to keep going. Yeah, it's awesome. Mm. It's, it's interesting when you're that sort of um, reflection as you're listening to yourself and you're... Because you don't often get the opportunity... To, to reflect on how you're behaving in as as much as that it's sort of yep. it can be quite confronting it's yeah yeah especially yeah. when um, you've got Clayton there letting you know what his perspective was on it <laughs> uh, he's usually quite free with that but mind you I I, I, um, I give it back to him <laughs> it's, uh, I, the thing I like best about my podcast is that we don't have to listen to his bloody intro um, when I do the podcast, right? Okay, yeah. yeah the g'day, g'day, yeah, g'day, 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 yeah. How you doing? Yeah, something, something. Yeah, yeah. that you've forgotten about that you forgot the words to. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I like, I, like it's see. got a really bad negative um, implant in my head. I'm like, yeah. oh, he's doing it again. And now all your listeners are going through that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, but so the podcast has been good and. What else have you been up to? Like, you've been doing a number of different things over the last few years. Like, uh, yeah, been... yeah, absolutely. I mean, I obviously love the tech space. Um, anything in, in uh, tech, reg tech, um, anything in... Uh, to me, it's all around um, how does the tech help the advisor and the consumer relationship, right? It's like, you know, the whole idea of robo-advice and all this sort of stuff around uh, our advisors are replaceable to me is all... Um, not necessarily what, what I'm focusing on. I really want to help the, um, as, as Peter calls it, the bionic advisor, you know, like the advisor mm. that has tech backing them up, making them look good, making them efficient, making them um, be able to have quality conversations with their clients, which is to me what it's all about. Um, mm. You know, not having conversations with your clients that's just all those moments that are just inefficient. Um, you know, like writing stuff down while the client's waiting for you to stop writing so they can, you know, talk again, um, all these sorts of things that just um, slow the process down and then going away and creating advice and coming back days or weeks later to deliver it, um, trying to, like all that stuff that's just completely frustrating and annoying as an advisor. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, the and process to is... To be able to think about tech in a way that go, who's using what tech, where in the world, that you can then apply to what advisors are doing with their clients yeah, yeah don't don't be content with the status quo that's right and and, and the best part about tech is it's always changing right there's always it's always developing and there's always new cool stuff coming on and um and it's you know there's stuff coming out um being developed and you know big ai type engines and you're keeping an eye on the stuff going wow that's going to be amazing when it comes uh, when it finally gets us down oh, to yeah, small business like- you know like it's you constantly listen to stuff that talks about AI and they say, well, it's got a while to go before it gets there. And but there, I think there's like there's a lot of little scoped uses of it that are yeah. quite useful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like it's it's really interesting some of that stuff that's coming through. Yeah, like even it's just even like I mean, Gmail. 
Oh. Like Gmail is like S- started predicting your words, and it's bloody good. Yeah, like I literally, I reckon it gets I tab half of the time. Like it gives me an example. Yeah, like yeah. there's a huge uptick in productivity. You should just start tabbing on purpose and, uh, and just, just see whatever, see, see how, see, see what you actually. Maybe they should have a setting just like auto auto Gmail. Maybe you could run a whole <laughs> podcast where it's just uh, where it's just auto and just have a voice over so it's saying what you're thinking. <laughs> Just try and get it to mimic your voice. Just spawn back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's um, yeah, all that, uh, that sort of brings to mind all the um, the conversational AI that's coming out in terms of like the chatbots and things like that. Have you have you sort of experienced some really cool ones? Or um, Well, obviously the Gmail is, is pretty cool mm. um, and, that, and, that, and that's got, uh, you know, um, but but not so much the that part of it because I'm trying to avoid writing as much these days. Okay. Um, and just and just you know spend more time having conversations and speaking and, and those sorts of things. So, um, but yeah, like the, obviously the Gmail, the, the, the best one out there at the moment for that. Yeah, it's really cool. Mm. On the on the voice stuff, have you been? Um, there's the like obviously there's a few tools in terms of like Marco Polo. Have you seen that one? No, I haven't seen that one. So Marco Polo is like it's we we call it like Snapchat for old people. And we use it for X Y Visor where you just it's a video message yeah. on your phone. Like it's oh, just an app. Yeah. So like you might use Slack to just chat instead of yeah like in some things you want to talk about a chat message is just not going to yeah. do it justice yeah I've seen um, um uh, you know there's the walkie talkie apps you the can Voxer just, you, know, you can just have a chat to and, and send that but also um there's a I saw one the other day I can't quite remember the name I'll, I'll have to try and um, get it to you so you can put it in the notes but the, it it's uh you, you can ask questions and you send your client or whoever a link and the question will come up and then it records their voice. So they just go, uh, you know, you had a question and you write the question and then it records their voice and sends it back to you oh. with, uh, as, a, uh, as an MP3. Very so then you cool. can save, save their voice messages rather than having to save, um, yeah, notes. An email, that's yeah, great. Yeah. And I like that. Obviously, you know, voice files are pretty cool because it's got their, you know, if you get really into was that was it that person that, you know, sent you that was you got the email tag, you got yeah, you know, yeah, all that compliance yeah. sort of thing. But yeah, it's an, that's an interesting uh, development. But you know, uh, you know, it, consumers now, our clients are used to using a lot of text. Mm. Um, they expect it. Yeah. So yeah, well, it's, yeah people that are uh, still skeptical or worried about it, if it, I think it's a, one of those things that if you're not being efficient and you're not using tech, then you're uh, you're probably it's, it's more of a ticket to the game. Well, than, well, you talk to a lot of advisors like around technology and what they're doing in the business. What do you what do you see as some of the biggest impediments for adopting and changing? Is it? Uh, I actually think it's the amount. Like, there's just so much to choose from. Yeah. And um, you know, like most things from a behavioural point of view, if you get too many choices, it's just overwhelming. And mm. you go, oh, I don't know what to. Um, so a lot of the time, it's just you know, the, work out what you want to do. And then just give one a go and, you know, don't try and compare 12 <laughs> because at the end of the day, you know, some will be better at one part and some will be better at the other. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's interesting. I, I know Pete, you're talking about Peter before, like she's, um, she's definitely been out there really, um, I guess, sharing some good ideas around how advisors can re-engineer their practices. And obviously that message is, very relevant now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the best part about it is the people that are out there sharing are all really excited about it. That's why we're sharing it, right? You're out there talking about mm. it, you know, like Peter's out there. And, um, and and we're all just excited about this stuff that's coming and how it can work and um, how, it can, how it can help that conversation and that relationship. And at the end of the day, that's what it's really about. Like you, the advisor-client relationship and there's certain, there's certain things that the tech can't do, like be empathetic in the conversation when it's needed or or be um yeah be assertive in a conversation when it's needed or whatever that whatever's needed at the time and that's the sort of stuff that humans will always be involved in but really just the tech has got to be there to back up what the what the conversation is right Mm. and um you know just in financial advice software it's all about then obviously calculations uh that used to be done by somebody in the back room mm. is now done can be done on the front end with the client in front of them so um, at real time real time and, mm. and, and and you know with data feeds you can get the client's data real time as well so their baseline where they are now is 
up to date today. And then there's, you know, when you're doing these calculations and strategies, you can do them with the client in the room rather than away at another time and coming back. So yeah, that whole live like advice thing is really yeah. So so really interesting. There's always it's an interesting power dynamic, right, between the consumer and, and their advisor. Mm-hmm. And uh, if from the point of view of you know you've got a, a a person that's there and they're seeking advice from a professional, right? So there's always going to be some sort of like a this, this seesaw of power and balance, right, in in a, in a room at any particular time. But if you've got if you've got the ability for the client to co-create the advice with the advisor, so a do with scenario, that's the ultimate, right? Because you don't want to have somebody coming and telling you what to do. Because mm. as soon as someone tells you what to do, you kind of lost the control of that conversation or that or that or that whatever that decision is, right? Yep. If you're going to make a decision and somebody's telling you what to do, then it's kind of like you 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 don't have ownership of that decision yeah, into the, because it wasn't yeah. your course necessarily. Yeah. So the idea is that if you're having a, that, that conversation and the software to be able to say, here's all the information, and this comes back to the transparency thing, right? With it. Here's all the information. Here's how it works. It's going to put you in a better position. What do you think? What do you want to do? And the clients go, yes, I want that. And then all of a sudden it's become a, a it's become a, um, they've made the decision and so they're taking the power, they're taking the responsibility for that decision and the advisor's role is to bring them the strategy, let them decide whether they want it and then implement it, right? That's the, and so once you're doing that, um, you know, it's the consumer owns that decision and then owns the, owns the plan, owns the, um, you know, that's what, to me that's what it's about, not just, not just that telling the people what to do. Well, you, like you've been a part of like a whole lot of, um, I guess user testing, not not user testing, but um, like focus groups and things like that. So this is a lot. Of what you're talking about comes from research. Is that something like in terms of what you guys have checked out and? I want to, it all, it pretty much comes from sitting with clients. Mm. You know, spending many years talking to people about what they want to do. Um, yeah. And there's some amazing advisors out there that I've learned some amazing stuff off over the years. And that's uh, from the very you know first day you become an advisor. You you're always learning off of off your peers and um, you know things like really getting to the bottom of what's making the client's decisions and obviously Ray does a lot of stuff in the space but mm. um, you know uh, I caught up with Eleanor Dartnell recently yeah. and you know we, she's done a lot of work in um, in surveying clients about what they, they require and need yep. and, um, and a lot of this and she's got some great questions as well and a lot of it's around questions Right. What are the questions, the, the power questions, if you want, that are that are going to get um, the client to really open up? And and Eleanor's ones are around. Where did the money come from? You know, treating the money with respect. How did you get that money? What sacrifices did you go through to okay. get that money? Understanding That's and then and then once 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 she goes deep like that into the the actual money, it's not just a I've got blah money to invest great let's do a little risk profile and see if you're conservative or balanced or right because if you if you actually start thinking about the behaviors that took place to get that money yeah and the sacrifices that were made and the things and then people start going oh my you know this advisor really respects my money and is going to treat that money as if it was me hmm yeah that right? deep that depth yeah and That's... so once once you start going there and then you, and then you can then you can start looking at, you know, someone's goals because I'm a big goals based advice um, advocate. Then you, what, why is those goals can be modelled and have different risk profiles, goal profiles. So just not about pulling it all together and and, and you know like individual sort yeah, of yeah, profiles absolutely. around the, each goal. Yeah, yeah, someone's got a, a, a goal to um, you know send their kids to private school. Great. What, what does it mean to them? Why is it? You know what's what. Why specifically do they want to do that? What's the, the route? And then you can turn around and say, well, that is so important that we can't risk that money because it's the it's linked to that goal. Yep. Yet over here, they've got an aspirational goal to do something crazy. And uh, and you can go, okay, well, let's you know, be a bit more aggressive with that. It's a longer-term goal and it's out there. So. Yeah, the, um, so, so Eleanor, Eleanor was one. And what was the other person you just mentioned? Um it was Ray. Oh, Ray, with the psychology. Yeah. Now that, like, I've always found what yeah. they did do at Trace to really interesting. Because, like, Ray, Ray went and did a psychology degree. Yeah. 
And Absolutely. he graduated yeah, yeah. this year, I think it was. Yeah, he's just graduated. Yeah. yeah. And uh, like really interesting um, journey. And like he's he's so like he believes in it so strongly that all advisors should actually go down that path. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've just had uh, Dr. Catherine Hunt on who is does the master's at Griffith University. Mm-hmm. And um, she started out with the psychology and then went into financial advice and then did, uh, you know, did a doctorate and et cetera, et cetera. So... Um, the same thing, and she's she's big on that as well around the whole. Um, uh, what is it that? Uh, what are the habits that? Because people can say something. Mm. However, what is their behaviour? Mm. Yeah, and then when you start thinking about their behaviour and what this, what's internal representations inside a client's mind and how they behave, how they act is actually true, more true to than what they're actually saying. Mm. Yeah. Well, like a lot of advisors, it, I think it's it's almost like. It may actually understanding some of this may not actually change how they do things. They'll just understand what's going on a bit better in terms of what what's happening with the client. And a lot of advisors, I think, do it intuitively. But I think that probably the difference is the consciousness and how that can then translate into um, like data capture of going, okay, well, actually, like the depth of those Eleanor questions. Mm. You might have that conversation, but it doesn't make it into the advice flow. That's another good point. Because a lot of advisors actually yeah. have deep conversations. Yeah. Like they, all, it's, they all have great questions. Yeah. But like, how does that... I think sometimes a lot of it get, may get caught up in notes and then like if you've got a team on the back end, that's the notes may not translate the, the depth of what was going on. And that's always been one of the massive problems we've had, right? Because as soon as you create a process that takes that a person, a single person takes more, of the, more and more and more and more of their time and so they outsource and they use other people and they, they get a bigger team. As soon as you do that, you lose you lose bits of packets of data along the information mm. stream, right? It's so like Chinese whispers. Things, things. Exactly right, exactly yeah. right. So, you know, we know as a childhood game that that doesn't work, mm. yet we set up businesses that that rely on that working yeah. and wonder why it doesn't work. So, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it, it puts another perspective on the whole outsourcing versus get more staff versus... Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not hassling outsourcing, I'm not hassling having mm. big teams, I'm just saying that... But it's a, it's a flip side of that. Yeah, yeah, if you think about what you're trying to retri- achieve and then you go, well, uh, you know, we, you know what, what is the problem in the process? Well, it's, it's generally a communication problem. Mm. Because, How do you cl- make it clear? Well, that? that's right, because the person who's writing the plan wasn't actually in the meeting. Mm. And so... For them to understand what was in the meeting, they actually have to keep going and asking questions or looking or finding more research or trying to um, fill in the gaps along the way. Um, and the other thing that comes into, into play here is, and Ray brought this up, was um, we all have biases. Or mm. We all have opinions and biases. And the advisor in conversation with the client has opinions and biases. I have an opinion, you have an opinion, and when we're talking to somebody, sometimes our opinion tends to bubble up and over and into the conversation rather than allowing the clients to have their most important opinion. The power planner has an opinion. You know, everyone has an opinion. And they're doing parts of the process and their opinion's being added to the, the process. So it's, it's quite often it gets to the end of the process and it wasn't the client's opinion at all. Yeah. It was it, it was the biases that we bring to the conversation. Well, yeah, I remember when I used to have those, be in the meeting with the client and you've, you're already, you're having this conversation, you're already, your mind's already going to, well, that's not a good idea. <laughs> You're already like, you're there and you're like, okay, come back to that. Don't. But even just having that thought then affects how you communicate. Yeah. So like... It's, yep. It affects your body language. It affects the way that they're seeing you. you yeah. You know, it's it's such... A, that's what they, makes they it They say so something and you slump down. They go, oh my God, I've said something that's wrong. And then, yeah, I'm yeah. a bad person. Correct. Yeah. It's so interesting. That, and, and like, but in terms of that, uh, we're talking about the arts, outsourcing beard and losing the communication. What have you seen techniques that actually keep that essence or that conversation intact the best? Um, so to me, it's around... So I'll go back a step. The, the financial advice process needs to be very much like a professional process. Like, I mean, I went, it's fair to say when I first started, um, we were trained by product manufacturers to about their product and why it was so good for consumer mm-hmm. and then we went out and found consumers that um, needed that product right or would now, accept it well it's just like well if they, you need a product you're great in a, oh what a great match let's put it yeah, together yeah. Um, and but of course the, the the industry turned 180 degrees and we said right now we're actually you know starting with a professional process so we start with a 
with you know and I love using the GP analogy around saying if you go to your doctor the first thing they do you can go there and say hey hey I need some medication for I need some sleeping tablet whatever you know and they go no 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 tell me all about your health you know what's going on in your life what stresses you know they ask you a crap load of questions yeah. which is what advisors do right yep. very similar so you go through that process and then they go we're di- I'm diagnosing a, a condition condition then after they've diagnosed a condition they then look on a treatment plan and that treatment plan may or may not include um, medication mm. or product right? yeah right as an analogy correct yeah. so we have treatment plan strategy product medication mm-hmm. and we go through this process but what we fail to do a lot of the time is actually make sure that we spend a lot of time in that conversation with the client question 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 diagnose you know like we tend to go so um, is the diagnosis the that's the I guess what's in scope of the advice and the goals is okay that... so I'm glad you brought up scope when you go see your doctor mm-hmm. they scope their advice based on your condition your, mm-hmm. your, your you know symptoms Right, they do not scope it based on their treatment plan or their product. Yeah, that's an afterthought. What that's... do we do? There's, there's definitely right? yeah, a gravitation to yeah. with that in your mind as you're yeah, doing exactly the first right. bit. So is it? And I'm not going to say this is right or wrong. I'm just throwing it out there <laughs> for you know people are going to come at me. Are you wrong on this phrase? But you know, here's, I know I probably am. But you know what? What if we scoped our advice based on the client's goals, and then looked at the strategy and there's plenty of great strategies out there and they're all and they're all you know and then there's plenty of great products out there that helped implement those strategies mm. right so what if we scoped on goals not scoped on insurance not scoped on you know super not right totally yeah so that's so you know that's yeah, there's a structure that's in play for a lot of licensees and the majority of the industry that really it really pre like <laughs> If you think about the scoping, the labels on it, it's it's pre it's it's predefining it's bringing it so close to the solution at that diagnosis stage. Well, that well, it was it was created again. It was created. Well, we've got a scope. What are we scoping? We're scoping the products, or we're scoping, and and so then it became the. Do norm. they fit in this bucket? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it things very quickly become the norm, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone starts doing. Then there's a new legislation. We think it's how it's supposed to work, right? And so we do it, and that becomes the norm. It doesn't make it right, you know. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong. And mm. but at the end of the day, we've got to really sit back and go, like there was a Royal Commission. We've got a problem. There's something wrong, right? Something needs to be fixed or changed because mm. clearly consumers are not loving financial advisors at the moment where mm. they could be. Mm-hmm. So what is what are we doing wrong? And and it, it could be that all of our beliefs that we've come to learn and mm. been taught, and we you, you do it, I do it, everyone else around us does it, so that makes it okay. Mm. Well, maybe it's not. Hmm. but maybe it is but I guess the answer is we should probably question be prepared to question ourselves on every little part of the process and go is this the right thing could it be done differently consumers? And now I'm a big advocate for if you want to do some planning in your business don't ask your other advisors around you because you probably get that ask your clients ask your consumers mm. what their expectations mm-hmm. are and then you can go through the process and go oh, okay how can I create the process that you want that still fits within the legislative boxes. Yeah, well, legislative licensee, and 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 that's probably another point to bring up in terms of like we talk about it being preconceived um, sort of concepts that everyone continues to run with that have been around for a while. The structure of the industry really doesn't help that change. It really with the with this sort of top down approach of a licensee structure really doesn't help the exploration that's required for some, to get to those these new sort of ways of doing things that it really I'd, I'd argue that it actually it helps maintain the status quo yeah obviously um, licensing is an interesting space because um, it, you know when FSR came out back in you know back in my day um, <laughs> it was really around you know the government or ASIC trying to license advisors and it, it was just like this massive piece of legislation and all these small businesses and advisors just went, well, uh, I don't want to read thousands of pages of Corporation Act how, and then try and work it out. I'm just going to get, I need a lawyer and then the lawyers were really expensive. So these licensee groups were formed mm. um, to do it for a lot of advisors. So, um, and whether that was right or wrong, who knows? Right? We can debate that till the, for, for weeks. 
Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, well, we've got these bigger groups, all these licensees, and now we're seeing, obviously, a lot of self-licensed advisors. And, and the idea is that if the, e- the easier um, you make the tech around the, the licensing and the reporting and the obligations and all those things, then um, then those smaller licensees can exist without it. It's a bit like... Hmm. I relate it to self-licensing as but I'm not saying it's right or wrong but like having your own SMSF now I don't have an SMSF right because I, I can I, I reckon I can just you get the similar results by using other right, structures like Correct. Right. absolutely right so and I see the obligations as a risk in your SMSF to say well I've got to apply to these obligations and I'm, it's just a risk I don't, don't really need when I can use the, Let's go the right. less regulation part. Correct, which is the same as AFSL licensing, <laughs> yep. right? Your advisor can go, well, you know, well, I can just use that and rather than have to worry about the time and effort. So, um, and obviously we're seeing a lot of that transition um, towards um, the groups that now provide support to self-licensed advisors. Um, I don't know how it's going to all go, but... Yeah, it's an interesting well, thing, licensing. I'd love to see ASIC come out or, or, the, or somebody or a body come out and actually um, work out how we can license advisors in a similar way to other professionals. Like an individual licensing Yeah, the, the fact that, I mean, I mean this, this requires um, government schemes. I mean, uh, other professions have government-backed um, liability schemes. Um, well, it's a huge one now. And, and think about and how much the liability insurance has probably gone up. Yeah, and there's kind of a reason why financial advice is a, a profession, but not a profession, because it has that. It doesn't have that other mm. professional liability scheme, and it doesn't have a similar licensing like your, you know, a, a, a governing body or a board or a state based. If it's legal stuff, it's all state based. So, 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 you know, I think that well, probably the, could be the, the move. But I can see technology really, really helping. Um, and, and it has to be led from, from those guys to say, well, okay, we're going to create a system. Advisor needs to do this, be able to report, and then just license everyone. Well, the, the, one of the things in the Royal Commission was that new uh, body that was talked about in terms of like a centralised uh, code monitoring and reporting body, which depends how, if that gets into gear, um, that has the potential to evolve into... Maybe that does run the um, the li- liability framework that everyone, no one needs um, yep. professional indemnity anymore. It's a central scheme. Uh, like it's it's almost like I don't know, you can it's all advice. Uh, the advice industry is so easy to go for me because there's a lot of things that are being asked, but on the flip side, not given. Yep. So if you think about like just even if you just the simple thing about the liability framework, like. Yep. You want to go. You want to give us. You want to force all this stuff. Open up all this can of worms in terms of liability, without actually giving a foundation of support to actually facilitate that. Oh, oh yeah, and I used to get really frustrated too when I was an advisor because it'd be like, you can't do that. Well, great. What can you do? We can't tell you what you can do. We just can tell you what you can't do. To me, advisors want to be able to just deliver the advice with confidence. Mm. Right, and, and to be continually looking over your shoulder and worried about which one's going to smash you. Um, I mean, you have to, you have to be, be, there has to be some form of regulation and policing, right? Um, but if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're not speeding or you're swimming between the flags or you're doing whatever you're supposed to be doing, you should have confidence. In, it's not the case at the moment. Yeah, there sure. should be some level of confidence because you know, if you're not delivering advice with confidence, it affects the consumers if they don't take the advice they're not helped in any way. In fact, generally they're worse off by not taking the advice. Yep. So it, it, it's an issue. Well, the, like on that, in terms of, I think the, the most interesting uh, next couple of stages of the Royal Commission impact parties out is what is ASIC going to be good doing? And that, that's, that could play into more prescriptive um, what advice should look like. Yeah. But which I, may be good depending on how they do it. Well, I think, I mean, I've spent some time with ASIC a little bit of time over the, the years and uh, in the reg tech space and I mean ASIC they're just doing the best they can mm. right they're just real, real people that are trying to do the best they can they get given all the bad cases right they don't get given all the good cases they see a lot of them they <laughs> just get to see all the bad cases um, and you know they so, so you know I, 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 I do feel sorry for some of the stuff that they have to go through and then cop because they've got to, they got to see something and, and take an action and then they put something out there and then they cop, 
crap about it, and well, yeah, they, they get copped it in the get, report as well. They get exactly right. So, so I don't want to get too much into that, but um, a lot of it's communication. Same thing, right? They're, they're not there. They weren't in the room. They weren't in the advice. If it was, if it, there was a way that the communication to Astor could be, here's the full story, right? And I don't know. It's 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 human nature. If, if you give somebody all the story, here's here's all these, here's all of our advice, here's all the things, have it regularly. It's all monitored, or, and, mm. and and they'll and the, and they're going to be much happier than because you're not um, you know they don't have to see the bad stuff. Yeah, I've got a strong belief. A lot of the challenges around advice get fixed if the capture of that init- that engagement is done really well, and it's documented really well. And like you, like one of the ways is just recording um, audio, and obviously that gets all the content, and a lot of people do that. But it's also still, it's not necessarily practical in terms of how you then grab that information and translate it into the next stage of the advice process. So you've got this sort of challenging conflict of like useful data points mm. that then facilitate an advice process don't necessarily always match up with um, the depth of a conversation that that goes on. And it's like, it's always, I I don't know, what, what I've been looking at is like how do you broaden the data capture, um, the tech data capture of what you're doing there. And instead of it just being like, one of the things would be like Ellen Dartmouth's question, how does that money that you've got make you feel data point? Like that becomes a data point that translates. So even if you don't have the full conversation around it, like it's, it's, it's hard to capture an hour and a half, two hour conversation. You end up with like a bloody um, war and peace sort of thing. Yeah. And, and it's no good for anyone because the next stages can't read all that. It's like, yeah. then things take too long. Order's not going to read all that. So it's these key distinct elements. I think it's just about expanding the data data points to really key elements like that question from Melanie Dartnell. Like, like, how does your money feel? Like, yeah. And, and capturing that yeah. and, and having that play through. Yeah, working out what really matters and then prioritizing those statements. Hmm. Yeah. And then, like, obviously that's not traditionally, like, the tangible nature of advice doesn't know what to, tr- traditionally hasn't known what to do with that. So it's, it's a bit of both worlds. It's like, you've got to work, you've got to have something on the back end that knows what to do once you get that information. Yeah. As yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> because most parent planners, you go, um, yeah, they felt really bad about that situation. Oh, that's great. Um, how much do you want to contribute to super? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's too literal. Yeah, there's no, there's not enough uh, of that, you know, kinesthetic emotion brought into that. Yeah, and I think, to, like to me, it's like how do you translate? So obviously that's important. It needs to be captured. Like it's, it's important for the client. Like it's obviously that connection with the advisor, the client. It's important for the legislator, like the license, well, the ASIC, and what what's been thrown out there from a compliance standpoint. But it just, we've just struggled to extract those elements and what does the service look like after that? Yeah, I mean, at that space, you're really looking at dreams and, and goals and, and values and mm. in, internal behaviours, um, in, internal representations as a way that somebody thinks and learns and remembers mm-hmm. because it's not about, um, you know, it's not just about what you tell them, it's what they remember and they can take away and, and have that conversation at, at a barbecue. Um, and... And then also being able to have a conversation with them in the way that they will take on what you're saying. Um, and, and so, you know, if somebody's very visual, using, you know, visual cues and then how does that look like? What does that look like to you? And all those sorts of things. And if someone's kinesthetic, you're talking about how that, they feel about this and how they feel about that and how this makes them feel. Um, to be able to get the real answers so that they can actually understand what you're saying and, and then they can relate back and have a conversation. So there's obviously there's some skills advisors can do in that space and understanding those types of things. Um, and, and so there's, there's, there's a fair different, few different skills that we don't teach advisors mm. that they can get. And you kind of learn it over time and then you, you, if, you know, a lot of advisors do a lot of stuff around improving themselves and improving you know the way that they can do and going out and seeking these things from external. But it's not a, it's not a part of the curriculum it's not it's you know it's very seldom it's a very small part of you know the skills that advisors have to learn but it's a massive part of the skill that they totally they well it's and the, the professional year coming in is it's going to be interesting how that frames up a bit more because i think there's yep. still a bit more to come in terms of yep. what fascia fascia fas, fas, 
Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah, whatever, <laughs> whatever they call yeah. <laughs> What they come up with. Well, I, I, yeah, there's, there's definitely that conversation. <laughs> I just still continue to think back to when I was like advising and like, when I, especially when I was first starting, like, like you, you, you have a great conversation, but you get this information, you go, uh, what do I do with this? Yeah. Like, you actually didn't have, you, you actually also yeah, need yeah. to be given the tools of actually what you do with when, when it's a broader thing that doesn't quite, there's, it's not a super clear link to yeah. like the traditional framework yeah. of strategy. And yeah. I remember when I was doing um, some tax, um, uh, uh, DFP, one of my tax things or something, where you, where, you know, you're working out all the tax, you know, the codes and you're working out the same as you do at school, you know, you work out the codes. This is how you actually do the formula. And then we had a, uh, a senior accountant come in and, and talk to us about and, and they didn't know any of the codes. They didn't know any of the formulas. They go, well, we've got calculators. They just do that, right? And so then that's the same now that we've got with with tech. We go, ah, oh, there's a strategy. Now I need to, well, boom, I just put it in the calculator and it gives me the number. And so now the the things that, you know, and Pasir and, and the ethics is one thing I, you know, agree with. You know, do, do a lot of stuff on ethics. You know, that's, you know, why not? Do a lot of stuff on questioning and, 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 and you know, the... The, the psychological side of how humans tick, but you know some of the stuff that we're piling into um, the framework is stuff that technology is going to do for the advisor anyway, right? So you, yeah, great, I'll know it, I'll learn it, and I'll throw it out next week because my my system does all that for me. Yeah, I I've, I've developed a belief that yeah, there's there's still too much. Um, like I actually. I remember having, I'd have young students in that have just been through university and it just reminds you of how irrelevant these days a lot of the technical learnings are because it just, it just doesn't, it doesn't apply. Like there's a hierarchy of value, let's say. If you go, if you look at advice and you look at the hierarchy of value and at the top of the hierarchy is that relationship and the rapport that's built between the advisor and the client. And then below that, you've got, I guess, what's discovered around the client, so the understanding and the goals and what's set and the needs and the wants and that sort of thing. Yeah. Then you've got strategy, a bit like what you were talking about before, and then you've got the product. So we've, we've gone from product being <laughs> the key focus. We then move to strategy. And I think... To me, a lot of advisors are still selling strategy and I think that is where there's still a big challenge because, and this is where, this is where, um, and the best, the best way to look at it is like how accountants look at advice. They, they get completely caught on the strategy because their world is a tangible world. Strategy is a very tangible world. Mm. But, it, and that's where a lot of the numbers sit and everything, but it's not where the value yeah. sits. Yeah, and, and, um, I listened to a talk recently about this this whole idea of of value in the in the advice and and list I'm completely convinced that they're relationship businesses right the advice business is a relationship business the better you are at having good relationships with your clients the better your business is going to be mm-hmm. that's the number one the, the the clients come in they you know they want their relationship you'll get they'll walk away with a strategy but that's not the part that they really value mm-hmm. right now um, you know returns on their investments. Yeah, sure, that feels good for a short term, and then they leave and they go back to, and to the world. But to, in my in my humble opinion, um, it's the relationship that really is what they're there for. Now we don't charge fees for the relationship; we charge fees uh, based on the returns and based on the amount of money they're going, based on the strategies. And so we have got this business model that sort of charging fees for the least important thing in the client's mind, then. Mm. than what we're doing so there's a massive conversation that we can have over the next you know year about what is it that clients actually value and mm. you know we, not many people ask them so that's the that's the first problem we've got yeah um but when you do ask them generally they're saying it's the relationship it's the person being there it's the fact that they understand my money came from this and that that's these are the sacrifices they understand me so that's the part i really value mm. It's not that whether you got seven percent this year or, or eight eight uh, percent, and and you beat the benchmark by one percent, or you didn't. No, that's not the part that they really give a crap about. I mean, sure, that's important to them at the time, but the long term part of it is that that relationship. And and I think we need to try and have a conversation at some point about how do we value that relationship. And 
And this is the problem. Like we go to a Royal Commission and say, and we just focus on the part that the clients don't care as much about. Sure, it's, it, it, you know, I don't want to get ripped off. No, no one does. But you know, we, 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 how do we bring that relationship into the into what we're what well, it's we're, a tangible versus intangible. Yeah, exactly right. How do we make that whole relationship part of the business model so that the... Well, yeah, how do you make the relationship tangible? Correct. From an yeah. asset yep. standpoint. Yep. Yeah, yeah. From a, from because a, I think, I think they're, they're looking for something tangible. Yeah. Which is... Under, or you can understand yeah. where they're coming from. They're going, you're charging money. Yeah. But do not tell me, Marbo, yeah. that yeah, like yeah. But, you've got to... Like the client, we're, we're doing great things with them. It has to come from an academic point of view, right? Because exactly. we've got to justify all this conversation. You and I can have a chat. We can be completely on board with it. But neither of us are writing academic papers to submit to government about what the standards should be. So the problem is we need to sort of get the academics of the country, and I think the psychology academics is the way to go, mm-hmm. right? Because they actually have a business model. They'll be able to model. translate what's going on there. They so. have a business model based on that, because they're not delivering financial plans or products, mm. but they still have a chargeable, I mean, they do it by the hour, which I think is wrong, but, you know... Um, Tell other business folks. <laughs> uh, it's... Uh, it never it's feels not, it's not value pricing yeah no, it never feels good it's not you know not based on that comes to me um, no my, my ultimate thing is that you know like a goals based advice the relationship works the clients focus on what they can focus on um, the advisor focuses on what they can focus on there's a joint relationship that the co-responsibility of building the advice together um, and and the next thing, the thing is if you're actually tracking goals along the way and you're helping people get to your, their goals then the number one outcome should be how many goals did you help your clients achieve, right? And so everybody says to me, oh, look, we do goals-based advice. We, you know, we, we check the client's goals. I'm like, awesome, great. How many goals in the last 12 months did you help your clients achieve? Mm. Right? Exactly. Okay. No, no one answers no one yeah. And if you ask a licensee, great, you've got 100 advisors. How many goals... Did you help those 100, those 100 advisors? How many clients were, were affected? And if you can pull those numbers out, then you can turn around to the next World Commission and go, yep, what do we do for our money? We helped our clients achieve 3,719 goals in the last 12 months. Half of them were not tangible. Well, well financial. Well, yeah. The other half yeah. were, like, we, they just feel much better about it. Well, the goal could have been living a security goal or it could have been a goal around, you know, just something small. It could have been a goal around just, you know, paying off the credit cards and getting rid of that stress and burden of the credit cards. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of people have, uh, they look at the goal sort of label on advice and there's some people I think go, okay, like that's, that's just sort of, it, they feel like it diminishes that relationship bit and the, cause they, they realize that that is the value. And I think this is, this is probably what I think a lot of the industry has to grapple with and understand and not think about goals based advice as speakers like a, um, like a better way of doing it. It's just the way that you have to translate that relationship into, so you can prove the value that you're already giving. Yeah, that's probably like yeah. So so I look at it from the con- from the from the human beings point of view, consumers point of view. That says we all dream about stuff, right? We go, ah, oh, you know, I'd love to do that one day. It's awesome. And then sometimes we think of stuff about a bit more, and then. Sometimes it plays on in mind quite a bit and we go, actually, I really want to achieve that. I want to go out and do it. And so then I'm focusing on it. And then when you start focusing on it, then you can put parameters around it. Can I achieve it or not? And you start really thinking, okay, this is possible. So then you put financial parameters, right? So there's this process, this whole process that you go through that that really would be great. To, and this Peter's done some great work. Hmm. You just go, what are these dreams? Let's take those 58 dreams you've got and let's just keep them going, right? And then one day... We're going to be in a position where we can pull one of those dreams down, put the parameters around it, start tracking it, and make it make it happen in the time frame that we want to get. If we don't focus on it, we're not going to get it. Right? Mm. And that that's the process that makes the consumer feel the progress. Right, the progress starts from the, a light bulb moment or a dream or seeing somebody else do something that they'd quite like to do, and they go, "Ah, oh, that, that, that looks pretty cool. That you know, that trip, you know, climbing Mount Everest. That looked pretty cool. Oh, I'll do that one day. You know, like the, whatever it might be." And then those aspirations or the bucket list or whatever, you can call it heaps of stuff. Consumers get it, right? And then you just go through and put start putting parameters around it. But the best the best thing to do is to actually have a safe space where you can talk about that. And you go, great, that's awesome. You know, like, we'll... we'll, we'll let's write it down. Can't throw it in there now because we've got other stuff to do this year. But let's keep it going, right? Keep fueling it. And then, and then once you hit some of those 
small. They don't have to be big. They can mm. be small things, right? And you go, well, you know what? You can actually do that one this year. Do you want to do that this year? And then you pull that in and you, tick, you get that and you tick it off. Now, once you start ticking that off and you've got a system that obviously that can tick it off, mm. then you, you, the, all those become reality, right? So then what happens? You go, you've got a system in place that goes, great, Patty, you, you've achieved the goal. You know, you, the thing, we've got it ticked. It. What are you going to do? You're going to share it with everybody, right? And tell everybody you achieved the goal. And then you're going to probably tell everybody about who helped you get the goal and how, who held you accountable and all that stuff. And sure, there's some strategy comes in place. Sure, some product comes in play. But the strategy and the product are not the big part. The fact, I, you know, the big part is... That's not what they're talking about. Is exactly right. Exactly right. And, and, if, and I guess if you... You, know, you go back to the medical thing, right? You, you're talking about, you know, the doctor helping you do whatever you need to do. The product was part of it. The strategy, was, the treatment plan was part of it. It's just all part of a big thing. And um, yeah, if we focus too much on the product, and I mean to be fair, that's that's where all the talk has been in the past. Doesn't make it right, you know. And I think, um, I think, you know, for, for me, that's a, that, that front end is a massive piece that needs to um, be brought. The conversation needs to be brought up. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's a very exciting space, and and on that note, advice intelligence. Yes, it's uh, it's where you spend a lot of your time these days. Yes, for what the guys that haven't heard okay. about it, what what are you guys like? Just tech out there. What are you guys doing differently? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a huge, 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 massive piece of work, and it's been going on for you know almost three years now. Um, so it's been a lot, a lot, a lot of work, and a lot of people have been working on in the background. Um, it really does bring that whole goals based conversation. To to the forefront, um, and the advisor having that conversation with the with the client, um, having an easy process around gathering data and fact finding, and, and being able to uh, upload information, um, having a client portal where it's live, up to date financial plan, a bit like you, you know, obviously um, the, the the portal that you're uh, you're used to with your whether it be banking or whatever you you know consumers are very much used to this this way of thinking now, um, having an app with your with your details on it. Then having that conversation to be able to say, well, here you, here's your here's where you are right now. We know that's where you are right now because you know you you you've got your all your data up to date in there. And if you uh, want to achieve those goals, then some of them might not be achievable. So we need to work out whether you need to change the parameters around that goal, put it up, put it down. Um, and then if that's the goal, what are some of the strategies that can get you to the goal, and what will then be needed off the back of that with the implementation. Um, but really being able to say, okay, well, that's what you want. If that's what you want to do, let's lock that in, and that becomes the plan. Uh, and the, one of the biggest uh, parts that I like about it off the end, that is the fact that once you've done that through a, a platform and a mm-hmm. system that talks to each other all the way through, is the documentation, the statement of advice. It doesn't have to go off to a third person to be created. It's just instant. It flows it's through. There. Yep. And so that can go to the client portal, and you do two-factor authentication, and they can... And they can continue. So that the conversation remains with the client, like the advisor client. It's all about the advice client relationship. So, you know, um, you know, it's not about preparing a, a power planning software. It's about preparing a, a software for advisors to have a, a, a real conversation with the, their clients and co-creating that advice in that space. And um, and so it's it's obviously where you know we're, we're the people that are there are all pretty passionate about it and. Mm. Um, and yeah, so we've been uh, yeah, going going crazy trying to make this uh, this make ultimate world. And and it was really a scenario of, like just because we have an advice process in place that we always have always done mm. doesn't make it right, especially when it's not engaging for the consumer. Right? Yeah. So you know we're trying to make uh, you know bring this whole client engagement thing to you know to the piece, and and um, you know clients are engaged. They're engaged with something because they're humans, right? So they, they there's something they like. They're just not necessarily engaged with what we're giving them or what the process is, and um, you know, like, there's a lot of talk around about disengaged client, disengaged members, right? They're not disengaged. They're just not engaged with with us. Well, they're not picking up what you're putting down. They're, they're engaged with something. You just haven't talked to them about they, it, I think. They have real emotions, right? They they like some stuff, but it's just not us. So, well, you... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, big big, cool. big piece of work going on at, at Advice Intelligence, and um, yeah, obviously, uh, yeah. We're, we're doing some demos in the moment, so people can jump on the website and jump on a, uh, a webinar. So dot com dot au? No, dot com. Dot com. Intelligence dot com. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And, and if you're lucky enough, you may get Fraser on your demo. Yeah, it? yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I tend to um, talk a lot off topic, so I just keep going on about stuff, and they're like, stop with trying to... Try what to does this button do, yeah. Fraser? No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't press the red button. Yeah. Don't press the red button. Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah, it's all good. So it's been it's been busy, and um, there's a lot of uh, stuff happening this year. This 2019 is the year. There's going to be some launching coming on yeah, soon, okay. and, and um, yeah, I don't know how long this takes to go out or when it will go out, but. Uh, looking at around uh, sort of April, this start ramping up some stuff coming oh, okay. up. Okay, yeah. bit more of a promotion of things. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to, don't want to, don't want to, don't want to say too much, but uh, yeah. they'll be. They'll be I, I imagine we'll be uh, shouting it from the rooftops. Awesome! Oh, I'm really excited because you've been at it for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep. So, yeah, uh, well, good. Fraser, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's been it's been fun. It has. I, I, I'd argue uh, we, I, I did say it could be our deepest conversation it may well be <laughs> we'll have to keep trying harder won't we yeah, yeah well, maybe another podcast or something yeah, yeah. sounds good Thanks. cheers Fraser cheers